Pandemic in the Lab is the final expansion to the Pandemic series and offers its own set of modules when it comes to the various challenges that you can incorporate into a Pandemic experience. It is also the only expansion to where you can play with one player or you can play with as many as six players. But first, I'm gonna kinda go over some basic things that I would do as far as introductory level stuff. When it comes to the components inside in the lab, the first thing that you're gonna see is that there are four brand new roles that you can include in any of your games. Some of the characters, like the local liaison here, have this lab challenge, meaning that while you can use the local liaison in any of them, they generally are gonna be used inside of the lab challenge when we get to that. You're also gonna notice that aside from the four new additions of the roles, there are gonna be some revised roles from previous expansions. The researcher from the base game and the epidemiologist from On the Brink are revised for the lab challenge. But that's not all that is inside of Pandemic in the Lab. In addition to the revised roles, as well as the brand new roles that exist inside of Pandemic in the Lab, there are also three new event cards that you can shuffle into your other compilation of events from both State of Emergency and On the Brink, as well as from the base game of Pandemic, of course. As is the rules with combining any of the expansion event cards with any other sets of cards from other games in Pandemic, you can only ever have two events inside of the player deck per player. So in total, if you were to play with your five or six, you're only going to ever have 10 or 12 event cards total in the whole deck, and you're never going to know which ones are which. So that's very important to keep in mind. But as an overview, here are the individual challenges that exist inside of Pandemic in the Lab. These individual cards that exist inside of Pandemic in the Lab aren't specific to Pandemic in the Lab. In fact, all of these cards that exist inside of the box are simply modifiers for previous challenges. On the left is simply adding two more cards to the Virulent Strain challenge inside of On the Brink. So, it doesn't really change much. You can just choose which ones to shuffle in and what have you. The cards on the right add to the mutation challenge that exists inside of Pandemic on the Brink. But the key difference with this one is that this one is a modification known as Worldwide Panic instead of just the mutation challenge. The key difference between the mutation challenge and Worldwide Panic is that the Worldwide Panic increases the cube supply to 24 cubes instead of just the 12 that were inside that expansion. The other thing that when it comes to the setup of Worldwide Panic is that it will only use the two mutation cards because unlike the old ones inside of On the Brink, these ones add two purple cubes every time they come up instead of one. So it adds a little bit more chaos in that regard. When it comes to the setup and how we talked about how various cards will spawn different kinds of cubes, the difference with the Worldwide Panic scenario is that on the first city, it'll put one purple cube on them. On the second city, it'll put two. And then it'll put three purple cubes on the seventh city. So it adds a lot more purple in comparison to what it would do before. Otherwise, most of the rules inside of the Mutation Challenge remain the same inside of Worldwide Panic. The key thing to know about Worldwide Panic's challenge in comparison to the Mutation Challenge and On the Brink is that for a Cure for Purple, you need two cards with one purple cube on them, and the rest can be any color, instead of it only being one. So that's just something to keep in mind as you modify whether you're doing the original Mutation Challenge or if you're deciding to upgrade to this Worldwide Panic scenario. Otherwise, the Mutation Challenge rules remain the exact same. All of the win conditions remain the exact same. That's literally it. So now, we are going to dive into the very first challenge that exists and is probably the biggest and most complicated portion 
of pandemic in lab expansion. And that is the lab challenge that exists. So, as a prerequisite before we get into the specifics of in the lab's lab challenge, is that for the lab challenge, cards are used and sequences are used to develop cures in the lab before they can be discovered. This challenge, just as a as far as getting a reference on compatibility with other expansions and what have you, is compatible with just the base game or can combine with any other challenge in any other expansion except for the in the lab team game. That is the only one in which this challenge doesn't work. So you can combine this with bioterrorist. You can combine this with emergency events, with superbug, especially superbug, but we're going to get to that at the very end. But otherwise, it can be used with everything else. If you're deciding to use purple vial right here, these vials in all the regular cure colors and inside of purple are, are going to replace your cure markers that exist from the base game. So you're going to put all those away and you're going to use these vials instead. And if you decide to use the purple one, it follows the same rules as any of the other purple challenges that we talked about so far. So it can only be used, the vial, when combining the lab challenge with the mutation or the bioterrorist challenges. Or if you're doing the superbug challenge. But again, I'll get into that later. None of the purple challenges can coexist at the same time. So you're either only playing the mutation challenge, you're either only playing it in combination with the bioterrorist challenge, or you're playing it in combination of the superbug challenge. So that's the first thing. But now let's get into the specifics of how this works. So when you're setting up the lab board beside the pandemic base game board, that is going to be the first place that it starts. Generally, you can have this board just sitting like it is with all these circles here. But what I like to do, as far as the setup goes, is that the five Petri dishes that you got inside a pandemic on the brink, go ahead and place them empty on each of these five circles. And I'll explain the layout of the lab in just a second. Once you have done so, what you will do is that you will shuffle all of these sequence cards, including these ones here that I've got laid out for demonstration purposes, and you're going to place it beside the board, and this is going to be your sequence draw pile. What you'll do pretty much from that point going forward is that you will draw the top card, and you will place it in the upper section of this top square right up here. Once you have done so, and all of the cure markers have been replaced with all of these vials, then pretty much everybody is going to get a lab action reference card. It's going to be a separate set of actions that are going to exist inside of Pandemic's lab challenge. The key thing with the lab challenge in comparison to everything else for key setup purposes is that you cannot use the field operative from Pandemic on the Brink. And you, can, and you have to use the lab versions of the researcher and the epidemiologist if you're using those characters inside of the lab challenge. The researcher and epidemiologist abilities are unchanged except for their new lab challenge abilities. The local liaison also has a lab challenge ability and can only be used inside of this challenge. So that's something to keep in mind. But now I'm going to change to a different view and kind of give you the visuals of what this is all going to look like. So, as an overview of this challenge, inside of the lab challenge, before a player can discover a cure, the disease must first be characterized and sequenced and its cure tested using lab actions to do so. When it comes to this initial setup, this is the way that it's going to look. But, if you decide that you want to work on uh, two cures at the same time, then you have the ability to do so, to have a card on the top and on the bottom. But, before we go over the individual actions, I might as well explain to you the various spaces. So, when it comes to the lab itself, I'm going to use the Worldwide Panic Cubes as an example. This 
is a sample area. Whenever you are using the treat disease action and you decide to contribute cubes to the lab, which is what you're going to need to do, then you can either put them inside of this sample space up top or place them inside of this sample space down below. The key thing to remember with the lab is that cubes that aren't back in the supply and are being used for lab work do count against the lose condition of the cube supply. So you gotta make sure that you have enough cubes to be able to run through the lab, but you're also getting through the lab quickly enough so that way the cubes can be returned to the supply so you can't lose the game. That's something to keep in mind. If we're going through the three circles here in the middle when it comes to the lab and the way that you're gonna be moving cubes from either of the two sample dishes into the other parts of the lab, going from the top, we have the centrifuge dish. And what happens with the centrifuge? Well, the way it works is simple. Let's say that this particular research station is just another cure color, just for example, as I want to work with the materials mostly in the confines of this expansion for this video. If we are moving this stuff into the centrifuge, only one color can make it through into the centrifuge. So if this is a couple of blues here, for example, and we got these as our other cube color, then we can either only send that one cube color or we send the other cube color. Any of the other cubes that aren't going to make it through into the centrifuge get removed from the lab and are returned to the supply. This is helpful if you are trying to get a multitude of a specific color, but it oftentimes can be quite harmful depending on the challenge and situation that you're in. The next sample area that either one of these sample dishes on the far left have access to is this one circle that's at the very bottom, and that is going to be known as the separator. Now the separator works very differently from the centrifuge, whereas where the centrifuge can only allow one color to pass through from the sample dish that it originated from, the separator only can take one of each color. So if you're playing with all five colors, then you can only ever have one blue, one black, one yellow, one red, and one purple ever make it through. Any excess colors of any other kinds are then going to be removed from the supply. So if you try to move them all, because cubes can only be moved all samples at one time, then anything that is a double of any other colors that made it through gets removed and goes to the supply. last area that the disease cubes can go from from the lab is going to go one of two ways. But I'm going to explain the first way through the circle here in the middle. Now this circle here in the middle is what we call the growth dish, aka the doubler if it makes it any easier. Because for any cubes that are inside the separator or are inside of the centrifuge, you can decide to take them straight into the growth dish and any cubes that are in there are going to be doubled. So in this particular example, because there was only one of each in the separator, then we would have double it up to where there's now two of each. And the same applies if you're doing a one of each kind of color or if you're doing one color. So if you get two yellows across, for example, then if you get it from the centrifuge into the doubler, then you'll end up with four yellows because they double up. Now, when it comes to from either directly from the centrifuge and the separator, or if you decided to go from the centrifuge separator into the doubler, the last thing that you can do is that from that point, all the cubes that you have can then go off of the board and be applied to any of the lines of research that you are currently working on. But let me transition as I've kind of covered the major workings of how the lab functions, but now let us go into the actual actions inside of the lab. So, as a general rule of thumb, in order to access the lab before you can even do anything else inside of the lab challenge in the pandemic, is that 
all of the lab actions have to take place at a research station. Whenever you build a research station at a particular city, if you remember the requirements for those, then at that point you get to do any of these lab actions for free. As I mentioned earlier when it comes to the sample areas of the lab, is that whenever you are treating a disease, then all of the cubes that you've decided to treat, you either decide if they're going to be used for the sake of the lab, or if they are going to go straight simply into the supply to keep up. But here are all of the lab actions that exist inside of Pandemic's lab challenge. We have characterize a disease, we have process a sample, we have test a cure, and we have sequence a disease. Processing a sample is the whole process of how the lab is going to function. Whenever you decide to put the cubes inside of the sample dishes from treating the diseases on the board, then you processing a sample is just moving the moving all of the cubes from a dish along one arrow and adjusting them as shown. Cubes may not be moved onto a sequence card without a cure vial. That is very, very important as it is going to go into this next step that is very important. Before you can even sequence through from the sample dishes, whether you're going through the centrifuge or the growth dish or the separator, or if you're just going through any of these two steps and then you're applying them straight to the sequence cards. Over here are two slots that exist behind these sequence cards. And the sequence cards themselves are going to be able to determine for you what possibility exists for creating a cure with that particular sequence card. In this top example here, whether you're looking at the cubes at the very top of the card or if you're looking at the circles here in the middle, these are your sequence cards that are going to be determining the color of the cure that you're working on. So in this example, we've got one that works for yellow that can work just for black, one that works just for blue, as well as one that works for red. In this particular example, this one can work either for being a red cure, or it could be for a black cure. The way that these gray empty spots are determined is that when you're using the characterized disease action, whichever of the two cures that you decide that you're going to make it be, then that color that you chose is what's going to fill in those two blanks. So if you decide to characterize this one in particular as the red cure, then those two gray spots need to be red cubes in order to work. Or if you decide to go with the black route, then it is going to mean that you're going to need five black cubes in order to create this black cure. And in this particular example, this one means that you can do any of the five cure colors. And just remember, any of the gray spaces that you see are going to remain gray until you decide to characterize it as any of those colors. And whatever color cure vial that you chose to put on top of the card is what those gray spaces are going to be. So if you decide to make it purple, then you need two purples, a blue, a red, and four yellows. If it's yellow, you need six yellows, so on and so forth with all of the various colors. The way that characterizing a disease works and knowing what vial that you're going to put on there is that from the city cards that are in your hand, if you are at a research station doing this, remember, you have to be at a research station to do any of these lab actions that I'm talking about. You then characterize the disease by placing the color card in your hand into this characterize square here. Then at that point, you then have the ability to place the cure vial that you chose to characterize it as. And then now, with this cure vial on this card, they then have the ability to move the appropriate cubes and gather the appropriate cubes and samples in order to work on this cure. This particular example, we're going to say that all the stuff that's on this card here are all black cubes for this black cure. Once this is all completed, and there is at least, at the bare minimum, of at least one cube on it, because it has to be any number of cubes, then you have the ability to test a cure. The way that it works 
is that inside of the syringe space that is right beside the characterized disease is that you then place that same color card. So in essence, you're going to be playing two black cards for this black cure. And then what you're going to be able to do at that point is that in order to test this cure effectively, you're going to look onto the pandemic board and you're going to select any one black cube and remove it, either to place inside of the lab or to throw into the supply. Once all of the cubes have been successfully sequenced through the lab, through the various dishes and processes, and onto the cards, the actual sequence cards itself have been characterized as a disease color and have been effectively tested, then in order to cure a disease inside of, in the lab, you are going to add three more additional cards in order to add up to your total of five. Essentially, this is the wonky way of doing things. So where instead of in base game pandemic, you were going to put five black cards, discard them at any research station in order to create the black cure, you're the one that has the hands on duty as well as everybody else can participate in the various steps of the lab process of manufacturing the cures for the various diseases. So it's up to you and your team to work out, okay, who has black cards? We don't necessarily have to give one player all the black cards. Everybody can jump in and throw in a black card to help characterize, can throw in a black card to help test, and then whoever has the other three can then decide to cure black at that point in time. All of the curing requirements remain the exact same for any of the various challenges, especially for the purple cubes. If you're doing worldwide panic, you would still need two cards that have purple cubes on them, as well as any other cities, and every other one is the exact same. Any roles that give fewer cards also give fewer cards to the lab sequence. So for example, the lab scientist that exists inside of the base game, the pandemic, with the four card rule, simply needs just one card to characterize the disease, one card to test, and two to cure in order for that to work out. So that's something to really keep in mind and really changes the difference in comparison to everybody else inside of the lab challenge. And it's definitely more complicated to wrap your brain around. If you decide that the research line that you currently have is either too complicated or you want to try to work on something else, but you end up characterizing another sequence card as the same cure color. So for example, in this hybrid one, we have this now becoming a new black. Any progress that was on the old sequence card that applies to the new one gets applied to that card and the other one gets deleted for the rest of the game because pretty much at that point it's very unlikely that it's ever going to come back. So progress can carry over if you get the right sequence cards and you decide to characterize things in a different way. If you are deciding that none of the cures that you are currently working on inside of the lab aren't working, you can use the sequence, a disease lab action, to just simply draw the next card that's on your sequence deck and just remove and replace it with whatever it is that you need. The actions that I talked about for the in the lab challenge, whether it be the characterize a disease, process a sample, test a cure, or sequence a disease, are separate lists of actions that take place inside a pandemic. So they're included with the regular set of actions that you can already take. And the lab actions that you're doing inside the lab do cost you actions on your turn from an overall turn standpoint. So that's really important. So you're either going to be doing stuff on the board of pandemic with all of those regular actions that you have in front of you, or you're going to be at a research station spending your turns doing all of the lab actions that are available to you. And it's treated the exact same way as any other set of pandemic. You have up to four actions that you can take. It's either going to be, from a larger standpoint, the base game actions that you're doing while you're on the board, 
or it's going to be at a research station doing all of the lab action stuff. And it's important to remember that for each research station that you build, you can do any of these lab actions one time for free. Key thing about the lab in general, where we talked about how the research station is the most crucial part and able to do, whether you're deciding to characterize a disease, whether you're processing a sample, whether you're testing a cure, discovering a cure, or sequencing a disease card, is that the growth dish, while it doubles up cubes, takes from the supply inside of regular pandemic. If you are ever using the growth area and there aren't enough cubes to double it with, then that counts against your lose condition and your team has lost the game. So that is something that's very important. But now let me talk a little bit about some of the extra blurbs and tidbits that are able to help you out. Inside of the bioterrorist challenge, if the number of research station on the board is due to the sabotage action, fewer than the number of sequence cards on the lab board, the bioterrorist chooses a line of research to close, discarding its sequence card, returning any cubes on it to the supply, and any city cards played to characterize it or test its cure. That's pretty harmful inside of that particular challenge. A cube removed from the board by events, the containment specialist's ability, the medic's ability to automatically remove cured disease cubes, etc., may not be placed inside of the sample dish. That is incredibly important information. In the mutation or bioterrorist challenges, the city cards used to characterize the purple disease must be a city with at least one purple cube on it. Inside the worldwide panic scenario only, the city card used to test to cure for the purple disease must be a city with at least one purple cube in it as well, which need not be the cube that was removed. In the bioterrorist and standard mutation challenges, any city card can be used. So that's something else to also keep in mind. Since an open research line already has a sequence card, this action is not necessary to discover a cure. It allows players to open the second research line, replace sequence cards for already recured diseases with new ones, or find more efficient sequence cards. Basically saying we're not going to make it redundant for you if you've already done all the work. And here is a very rare exception to take in mind when it comes to the lab challenge. If a game ends because a player cannot draw needed cards, and one or more colors of disease cubes never appeared in any cities, either during setup or play, then the players win if they cured all the other diseases, since in this challenge players cannot cure a disease without at least one cube of its color. So, if no cubes ever show up, it's kind of an easy pickings for a win. So, here's just a recap of the lab actions and the lab challenge to hold. Lab actions must be done at research stations. All cubes in a dish must be moved when processing a sample. Cubes cannot be freely returned from the lab to the supply. This is very important in deciding do we want to move the cubes to the supply or if we want to use them to the lab to make the cures. Cubes cannot be moved onto a sequence card until it is characterized. You need to make sure that you have those city cards to characterize the disease is and those sequence cards in order to put the vials on the cards. So that way you know that this is what we're working on. Gray spots on sequence cards must be filled with cubes matching the cure color. However, if the colors that you see on the cards have been eradicated from the board, then you can place those cubes with any cube color that you want. So that's the freedom that comes with the lab challenge in particular when you decide that eradicating a disease is very important. And remember, a cure cannot be tested until at least one cube is on a sequence card. The cube removed by test a cure is returned to the supply and is not added to the lab. Different players than the one intending to discover a cure can characterize or test it. Like I said earlier, everybody can pitch in at the various steps of the lab challenge. Cubes of an eradicated disease in the lab can still be used to fill out spaces on sequence cards. Because, like I said, all of the eradicated spots can be used with any color now to where they can be more beneficial, make it easier to develop cures for other cards. Other than that, 
all of the wind conditions that exist inside a pandemic remain exactly the same. I want to say that the biggest challenge with the lab challenge more than anything else is having to work through the entire machination and process that is the lab itself. Remembering to be at research station, knowing who's taking part in which step at all times is incredibly crucial. But otherwise, hopefully, that this challenge definitely makes a whole lot more sense for you. And honestly, throughout the rest of this tutorial, the challenges I feel get a lot easier from this point. So the next challenge that we're gonna be covering is the solo game challenge, which really focuses on the CDC and basically whatever skills that you have picked for yourself at that point in time. The CDC game is compatible with every other challenge that exists, both inside in the lab, as well as inside on the brink and state of emergency, with the only exception being the bioterrorist challenge. There's a couple of setup differences when it comes to the solo game in comparison to when you're playing with other people, and they're pretty much as such. The field director and the pilot are pretty much weaker roles in this game, but they can still be played if you so choose. Whenever you are shuffling the player deck and before you incorporate the events into the game, you're going to shuffle the, the city cards based on the difficulty that you want your game to be. If you are going on easy, you're going to deal 8 city cards and put them in the discard pile. If you're doing a standard game, you're going to do 12 cards. If you're doing heroic, you're going to do 14 cards. And if you're going really crazy and you want that legendary challenge, then you are going to discard 16 cards from the player deck. If more than six of the cards while you're discarding are the same color, you're going to redo this until no more than six cards of the same color are in the player discard pile, basically giving yourself a variety of colors rather than running out of a possibility of being able to cure. The other things that are involved when it comes to the solo game is that you cannot use the event special orders and you're only gonna ever shuffle in four event cards. There's no rule regarding two for every player or anything like that. It's only ever gonna be four event cards, which is good depending on what events you get, but also makes it really tricky to go with. Also, the other thing about the solo game is that your role selection options are pretty limited, as you can't use the dispatcher, you can't use the researcher, you can't use the epidemiologist, and you can't use the local liaison roles. You pretty much at that point just shuffle the other roll cards and deal one to yourself pretty much in the same way that you would in the pandemic base game. The only other roll card that's going to be out is the CDC card. But it doesn't have a pawn that's on the board that's right beside you. And ultimately all that's left for the CDC is just a couple of key things. The CDC can't share knowledge with you in regards to the fact of like you can't meet up with the CDC anywhere and trade cards with them but the CDC can only do one action you have up to four actions inside of regular pandemic whereas the CDC only has one the whole other thing that you also got to make sure of is that at the end of each round for the CDC is that the CDC actually doesn't draw cards at the end of the turn. They actually use actions in order to draw cards in order to help you out. And honestly, these are any actions that the CDC can take. This is the only one that it can do. It can either move you. It can either reassign your role. It can exchange data, but it can only do this by swapping any one of its city cards for one city card from your hand whose color matches the city you are in, and you have to be at a research station. And doing this has no effect on hand limits. The other action that the CDC has is that it can draw a card from the player deck. And of course, as a regular player, it resolves epidemics as per normal. And it also has a hand limit of seven cards, just like a regular player would. And also discards like a normal player. It discovers cures the same way whenever it gets the five CDC city cards of the same color. 
but it does again it's not a player so it can just do that whenever it gets that color if you're playing the lab challenge the CDC may instead do one lab action as its action so it's possible to play it with the lab but honestly that's all that there is to the solo game it's a lot more restricted and I definitely think from personal experience with the fact that it's only just yourself and a singular car that's running the game it's very different from getting multiple human players to actually play with you and to kind of pick your brain and find those different perspectives that your team might come up with in comparison to whether you're doing this by yourself. But honestly, that's all there is to the solo game. You win and lose the same way as any other module or any other way that Pandemic has mentioned previously. Now I bring to you the last challenge, and probably the most interesting challenge is you can play up to six people inside this challenge, which is way more in comparison to any other expansion that we've covered inside a pandemic. This is the pandemic team game. This divides either four or six players into two or three rival disease control teams. Racing to cure and eradicate diseases, prevent outbreaks, and gain prestige. The team with the most prestige at the end of the game wins. This adds a competitive element while retaining the cooperation between each team's partners. The team game, for the basis as far as what you can and can't play with it, can be combined with any other challenge except the bioterrorist or lab challenges from earlier in the video. Honestly, the biggest thing with the lab challenge not being cooperative is just the fact that it makes it way too complicated for trying to remember what team is trying to use what cubes for what cure as there's not enough for the teams to be able to effectively use. The setup works mostly the same in regards to the pandemic decks and what have you except that there are quite a few differences. So the first thing that you're going to do is divide the four or six players into two or th three two-player teams. In this particular instance, since I'm just using the component roles that exist just inside the box of Pandemic and Lab, we're just going to have the two teams of four and you're sitting in front of us. Each team is going to just get a simple reference card at that point. A basic Pandemic reference card. After that, you are going to shuffle all of these goal cards and deal one face down to each team, returning the other ones to the box. Each team can look at their goals, but should not discuss it out loud nor show it to the other teams. The reason for this is that each of the cards have different goals on it. So, for example... We can see on this particular goal card that the first cure that takes place is going to allot that team six prestige. Any other cures is going to allot three points. The first eradication is going to add an additional six points. And any other eradications are going to add three points. And these goals are mainly just going to be kept face down and it's going to be what that particular team is trying to work towards. Ultimately, inside of the team game, in comparison to any other version of Pandemic, is that the teams are still collectively trying to work together to not lose the game, because everybody still needs to win together, but ultimately you're also trying to play for points as well, to where as long as you satisfy the conditions to where nobody loses, then it's pretty much fair game for competition-wise, because... All that the end conditions consist of is that you discover cures for all four of the diseases, or you discover cures for three of them and eradicate three of them. Once a team wins, you're going to flip over all the goal cards that you have if you've done all your stuff, and you're going to count up all the prestige and get your points all together. Pretty much at that point, whoever has the most points wins the game. All of these tokens that you see here in front of you are given to that respective team whenever that happens. So starting from the left here, we see that we've got 
the blue cure, and then blue eradication. These tokens are going to be placed in front of the teams for when they do hit those milestones. And it's kind of going to be the reminder of what points may or may not be up for grabs. For purple, in particular, is whether you're doing the Worldwide Panic Challenge, the Regular Mutation Challenge, Superbug, or Bioterrorist, but not Bioterrorist because Bioterrorist isn't compatible, but any of the other purple challenges, we can see that this one closest to us is that if you eliminate the last purple cube off the board, you get an additional four points to whatever it is that's on your vote card. If you get the purple cure, then you get an additional two points. For the first cure that happens in the game, there's going to be two points. That's the one closest to us here. And then the one in the back is the first eradication of the game is going to get you two points. Then there's ones for red to where there's a cure and eradication. One for black cure eradication. If you have the virulent strain inside of the team game challenge, for the first cure that happens of the virulent strain is going to be an additional four points. And the eradication of the virulent strain is also going to be an additional four points. And then lastly, there's the cure for yellow, and then there's the eradication for yellow. All of these little tokens, again, will play into effect and will vary on which ones that your team wants to grab based on what your goal card is. With the objectives explained as far as the goal cards and the way that the point system is kind of figured out, here's pretty much the rest of the setup inside of Team Game. So everybody will have picked their roles and divided up into teams and gotten their reference card. They'll have gotten their goal card, pretty much. And the way that the role cards actually work inside a team game is very different in comparison to everybody else. You're going to shuffle and deal three role cards face down to each team. Each team selects two to use and assigns them, returning their unused role. When all teams are done, Flip the roll cards face up and take the respective pawns. You are only going to ever use two event cards per player, meaning that depending on the number of players, you are either going to end up with either eight event cards in the game or you're going to end up with 12, which is more than playing a five-player game, just as a sort of idea. Each player on that respective team's is going to get two player cards. So it's way less, but remember, you're working collectively as a group here inside of your own individual group. If combining the team game with a virulent strain challenge, do not use the hidden pocket virulent strain epidemic card. Then the next thing that's going to happen is that all of these bonus cards that exist are then going to be shuffled, but you're only going to use 10 of these. Use as many of these bonus cards as there are epidemic cards. Return unused bonus cards to the box. Shuffle one bonus card along with each epidemic card when preparing the player deck. So that pretty much puts you at the same ratio of a chance of getting an epidemic, whether it be through the regular green cards or the virulent strains, versus getting these. And all of these bonus cards have individual powers that can help out the various teams and if you notice here at the bottom here sometimes if you hold on to the specific cards sometimes they get you additional prestige points on the back end as well so that's something to really keep in mind so if you want to look at these you can but ultimately you're never going to know what is or what isn't inside of the game once the bonus cards are inside of your pandemic game, something to keep in mind is that bonus cards, unlike events, can be used only by players on their specific turns. So, ultimately, you cannot use it any, at any time like you can an event card. The troubleshooter must discard regional response team cards when playing them. So, even though the troubleshooter has the ability to make flights and stuff, in various locations due to the troubleshooter's power inside of on the brink they don't necessarily have the ability to do anything with the bonus cards 
all of these rewards here that are sitting here in front of you that I explained way earlier inside the challenge, you're going to make sure that they're sitting on the side of the board for teams to claim as they see fit and whichever ones you're using. And making sure that these virulent strain and mutation challenge ones are taken out if you're not using those challenges. The most important thing when it comes to the setup of the team game challenge inside a pandemic in the lab is that the infection rate marker is going to sit on the third two space and not on the first. It's really important as it hastens the game for all players, essentially. Each team is going to then receive one of these three green team research stations. What's going to essentially happen is that these research stations are used in addition to the general white research stations that can be used by any team regardless of whomever, including the one that starts in Atlanta as the CDC. Basically, everyone's going to choose which team goes first, and starting with that team to the to its right and going in counterclockwise order and not clockwise like most games are particularly associated with, each team places their team research station and pawns in a city at least three connections away from another team's research station, but it could possibly be within three spaces of Atlanta. Once at that point, you are going to then begin the game. Players will essentially take six actions that are split up between the teammates. Obviously, if the generalist is in the game, then that divvies up to one extra action. So where instead of six, it's going to be seven actions that can be distributed between players in any particular way. It's all of the general actions that are inside a pandemic, such as the various flights, the sharing knowledge, and the way you travel as well as the ways that you're making up cures. The interesting thing about this, because you're playing as a team instead of playing individually, is that at the end of up to your turns, is that each player is going to go on their team. So like, let's say team one here on the left is going to take their turn. We're going to start with a pawn on the left and then just go opposite. So that pawn is going to do up to, let's say we're going to divide it three and three. So where they're going to do three actions each. At the end of each pawn's turn, they're only going to draw one player card. Because ultimately, you're going to be doing it for yourself. And of course, you're going to resolve any epidemics or anything like that and resolve your hand limit, which is the same as any other game of pandemic. The infection rate, as far as a max goes, never rises above four. Once the infection rate hits the end of that is reached, the infection marker stays there in later epidemics, which is really important, as it pretty much already makes it hard enough for all the teams respectively. And then pretty much everybody does their turns. The key thing is that while everybody does their actions normally, if you decide to share knowledge across other teams, let's say that team A on the left wanted to share knowledge with team B, in addition to following any of the team rules, is that it's going to cost you two actions to share with an opposing team in comparison to doing it within your own team. Because... Essentially, it's due to the team's incompatible disease procedures and disagreements with one another. Whereas, within team just takes one action. Another key thing when it comes to actions is that only its owning team can use a team research station for shuttle flights or to discover a cure. A regular research station may be built in a city with a team research station. Team research stations may not be rebuilt elsewhere. So basically saying, once you've built your team research station, that's all that you have. In a six-player team play only, the Discover a Cure action requires one fewer card of the Cure Color, typically four cards, with three cards for the scientist, and so on. If several teams wish to play events at the same time, 
The team taking its turn does so first. Then in clockwise order, the other team does so. And then pretty much like I mentioned, you're going to be following the goals for cures, eradications, and any other bonuses that you're going to get. As well as picking up markers as you do the various things as far as the various cures and eradications and things of that nature. In the mutation challenge, if the game ends by a team removing the last purple cube from the board, give the team doing this for prestige. This is listed on the back of the eradication as well. The last thing that needs to be mentioned as far as etiquette goes is that players can listen to other teams as they plan. Team members may show each other their cards and point to them when planning their turns to say less out loud. The team game can be easier as the teams together have more actions, more events, and greater hand size to assist them, despite the higher infection rate. Most diseases can be eradicated, however the players can lose when a team that is behind refuses to help cure a final disease. Teams should keep their goals hidden to help keep the game's outcome in doubt. Teams that are behind can eradicate a disease to both narrow the prestige gap and possibly end the game without a final cure. As an option, once players are experienced with a team game during setup, deal two goal cards along with three roll cards for each team to look at before picking one goal card and two roll cards to use. Honestly, it's just a way to spice things up inside of your pandemic team game situation. If you manage to stay all the way through from the very beginning of this pandemic and the lab tutorial that talked about all of the various challenges, I thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This has been a lot of work coming into it and being able to try to break it all down and cram as much information possible because if I'm being totally honest, pandemic in the lab is the hardest expansion to wrap your brain around. On the Brink would by far be the first expansion that I would get. It's simple enough as it keeps familiar concepts, but this expansion really steps things up for you with an entirely lab challenge that you have to figure out, a solo game, which is a little bit harder, and being able to play in teams, which is more interesting. So yeah, find out which challenges that you want to combine inside your pandemic collection. And who knows, if you guys are up for it and want to see it in the comments down below, I might even do a mega tutorial that combines the base game and any of the compatible challenges that exist inside all of the pandemic expansions on the brink, state of emergency, and in the lab. Otherwise, make sure to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next video.